All right, we're going to talk Travis Hunter here on the Our Lads Football Network, the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. We're going to break him down. I'm not going to break him down. I'm going to host this discussion between two of our top scouts here at ourlads.com. Right now, he's got the role of Assistant General Manager, John Cooper. How's it going, John? Doing good. Dave, who's got the role of Our Lads Senior Scout. How's it going? Great. Really excited to get into this conversation. Uh, I think Travis Hunter is, of all my years doing this, which is not nearly as long as, as Coach Coop, but it's it's probably one of the most unique prospects I've ever seen in this entire process. So I'm really, I'm really looking forward to listening to what John says and, and to sharing some of my few thoughts as well. Yeah, this is uh, really, you call this our official first 2025 NFL draft video discussion on players that uh, are going to be available or should be available for the 2025 draft. So uh, I know it's only October, late October, but it's never too early to talk about next year's draft. That's for sure. So Ramona, remind everybody, uh, if this is the first time you're watching a video here on our leads on the, our leads uh, YouTube channel, check out all of the scouting videos that these two gentlemen uh, will be producing and uh, publishing between now and the 2025 NFL draft. So we just figured this would be the perfect player to start one of these discussions with. And for, uh, for, for, the, for having both of these guys on at, uh, at the same time, we thought it would be also be a good idea since Travis Hunter is just such a unique player. He, he plays two positions. We're going to use this time to have Dave kind of take the side of Travis Hunter as a wide receiver and Dave take the, uh, John take the role as Travis Hunter as a defensive back. Uh, not to say that these two uh, scouts don't like Travis Hunter in both positions, but we wanted them to have one position so we could make this a very unique discussion. And that's how we're going to kind of do this. So um, what I want to start off with, first of all, is um, he, uh, Travis Hunter, John, he's got a shoulder injury he's been dealing with. Uh, matter right. of fact, he sustained it against Kansas State. He did not play in the second half last week. You look back at high school, he missed some time there with a high ankle sprain. Last year, he missed three games. I believe it, uh, I'm not sure what it was. It might have been a concussion. It got hit hard, and I'm not sure we heard what it was, but he was out for three games. When you talk about a player that might be playing two ways at the NFL level, uh, are you concerned that here's a guy that has had some injury histories? He's not the biggest guy in the world that you want to kind of temper having him play too much. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, I he's uh, obviously not the biggest guy in the world. Uh, and, you know, his shoulder injury, There's the more you're on the field, I mean, if he's on the field for 80 snaps a game on average or more than that in, in some cases, you know, there's more opportunity, obviously, to get hurt. And, you know, if you're tackling guys, you're leading with your shoulder, uh, yeah, there, those are those are situations where you're, you're going to sustain some injuries potentially. And uh, so that is definitely a concern. You know, I go back watching football a long time and seen guys that have played both ways in the NFL, um, you know, not in, in recent memory, but, uh, you know, Roy Green is a guy that comes to mind who I thought the Cardinals used him very well in the 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s as a receiver and as a defensive back, but he was not full-time at either spot. Now, his, he was so valuable Eventually, he only played offense because he was the best receiver they had. And they had a whole bunch of other guys that could play the nickel spot that he was playing. So, you know, that, that could be, you know, something that to look back on as where a guy like Hunter might end up. Uh, Dave, uh, let's, let's take a, a look at the next level general manager NFL and, 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 a bunch of them are going to be taking a look at Hunter and deciding what to do. They've got a coaching staff. Certain coaches want to use players a certain way. I'm sure the offensive guy and the defensive guy are going to have their say. Uh, do you think the general manager, I don't, again, this is uh, going to be different for all of them, but do you think uh, the, the, the prototypical general manager needs to look at him as a special player, uh, especially if they draft him? Uh, do you think that, hey, this guy is too unique? Uh, we're not saying he's going to play both sides of the ball, you know, all game, but we got to use him. Uh, if, we, if we, if we draft him as a wide receiver, we have to use him a little bit as a corner and vice versa. How do you think that role, how do you think that scouting is going to, is going to be in that war in those war rooms next year when you take a look at this kid? The most important component of this entire situation 
is that there's complete cohesion between the front office and the coaching staff. And with how much change, how many changes we see year to year across the league in not just the coaching staffs, but the front offices as well, that is, that creates a whole episode of issues that could really derail his career is that if there's not cohesion between the coaching staff and and front office, and he's going to be a high pick. So predominantly teams that are picking towards the top of the draft have just recently seen a whole facelift of not one or both components, or at some point will, if history repeats itself. And that's one thing I'm a little concerned with, with Travis Hunter is him simply getting to the right situation that dictates so much success or lack of success with NFL draft prospects. And, you know, when we, when we talk about our hits and our misses, a huge component, a huge variable to that answer is where was the cohesion between the front office and the coaching staff and how many changes were made. So I think that is probably criteria number one for Travis Hunter and his, and his staff, his management staff is that hopefully he gets to a spot where there's a lot of consistency and just one voice coming coming up together. I'm going to ask both of you guys this question. I'll start with you first, uh, Dave. So if you had to decide right now yeah. where you think he should play full-time and then where he should play a little bit at times, we're going to play him here, but that's his full-time spot. Where do you think he should play his full-time spot? Well, if I'm his agent, I'm picking the offensive side of the ball. That's for sure. <laughs> because, I mean, there's there's 18 wide receivers in the NFL making 20-plus million dollars. There's only five corners in, in that realm. There are six receivers making over $30 million per year. There are zero corners making over 25. So, economically, Travis Hunter probably wants to pay wide receiver. But I'm going to try to take that out of the equation right now and just answer this from a football equation I believe Travis Hunter should be a wide receiver at the NFL because there are a lot of special traits to him that you cannot teach. And this is an offensive league. I do think there's a lot of value in cornerbacks, but if you took, if you put, if you pin down every single head coach in the NFL and said, Hey, I'm going to give you a guy that could be a number one wide receiver or number one corner. I'm pretty sure the predominant answer there would be the receiver. So to me, he credibly projects to both spots but because the wide receiver simply has more value in today's NFL, that's where I would lean. John, uh, Dion came into the league. He was a corner and then played some wide out. Do you think Dion, if he was playing today's uh, game, do you think he would follow in uh, Dave's advice there and maybe his agent's advice and, and maybe become more of a wide receiver first and a corner second? And then how do you see Travis? Same question that I asked uh, Dave. Well, don't forget, uh, Dion also made a lot of money playing baseball, so he probably didn't need it. But uh, uh, but anyway, the bottom line, you know, Dave's right. I mean, receivers make more money. There's no question about it. I mean, that's where that's where the money is. You know, the question is, where is the longevity, too? Uh, you know, I think uh, a great corner, you know, probably lasts a little bit longer than a, than a wide receiver, if you, if you look at the number of years. And again, it all depends. But uh, the, the other issue there is uh, – the team that drafts him, you know, how are you going to view this player? He is special. He has some special skills. And he obviously can play very, very good defense. And, uh, you know, he's a great zone corner. And the question would be, is there a way we can use this guy as a wide receiver? We're playing three wide outs most of the time anyway. 11 personnel is, is the number one offensive set these days. And so you're, you got three wide receivers on the field. And the other on the other realm because of that 4-2-4-2 a nickel package is also so you're going to have five defensive backs on the field and so you've got to have those defensive backs I could see a situation where Hunter is a receiver and that's his primary position he's one of those three guys that's on the field most of the time in your in your offense uh, I don't see him as a slot nickel corner I do see a situation where he could be a dime back and he could be very, very effective on those third and long situations against 10 personnel, things of that nature, when people have four wideouts on the field. Most people don't do that much. But either way, if you're going to play dime, he could be that sixth defensive back, and he could be extremely effective. I would, if it was me, I'd play him outside and have one of my outside corners play that dime spot. Uh, it's kind of the way the Ravens do with Marlon Humphrey. Humphrey starts out on the outside. And then when they get into the dime package, he moves inside. 
and, and in some sets, he's inside right from the get-go. And I don't see uh, Hunter being playing inside. I see him playing outside. And I think he could be effective in that role, and he might see 10 to 15 snaps a game. I'm not saying this is the way it's going to be or it sure. should be. I'm saying this is a scenario where the right team could use him that way. And, again, you have to have a head coach that's secure in his role. He's got a good relationship with the coaching staff, the front office. Uh, a guy like a John Harbaugh, he would be an ideal fit with the Baltimore Ravens, in my opinion, for the type of the way the Ravens operate their program. And he has had a two-way player in the past, you know, in Patrick Ricard, who played offense and defense in, in a limited role uh, as a situational player on both sides of the ball. In this case, Hunter is probably going to be your number one wide receiver, but he might be a nice dime back as well. Yeah, I know it's early, but and and uh, and and don't worry, we'll we'll get a mock draft up at some point before the draft. We're not going to do it too early, but we know how everybody loves them. And I bring this up because you just talked about how important it is for where Travis Hunter is going to land, and it'd be nice to have John Harbaugh coach him and so forth. But a lot's going to depend on, of course what teams are really realistically going to have a chance to get him? Unless the team trades up for him, of course. And uh, you take a look right now. And I believe if the draft ended, to, it began today, you'd have the Patriots, Carolina, Cleveland, and Tennessee. Those would be four teams that look like realistically that not only are they at the top there, uh, John right now, uh, Dave right, right now, but they yeah. probably stay there for most of the year. So just one of those teams stick out to you? I mean, if Bill Belichick was still in New England, boy, would he be the perfect coach for Travis Hunter, but he's not. So out of those four teams, uh, does one of those teams stick out? And you go, yeah, you know what? That's probably the best spot for him. Man, I I, I would believe it's actually going to be New England. If you ask me right now, let's place a bet on which one of these head coaches and front offices will still be together in five years. Out of New England, Carolina, Cleveland, and Tennessee – I'm probably going to go to New England, and it's partially because New England just had sustained two decades of the same head coach, and they hired from within yet again, so they want continuity there. I think that's a big reason why they they stuck with Drake May, and they didn't take any trade offers. They want to get the head coach. They want to get the quarterback, and the next up for that team, if you ask me what is the biggest need on New England, it is a playmaking wide receiver. And that, that is where Travis Hunter comes into play. And Gerard Mayo learned the game as a coach and as a player under Bill Belichick. And Bill Belichick has kind of intertwined offensive and defensive players as well as anyone. Troy Brown, uh, Mike Vrabel, guys that did have a position on the side of the ball, but there were opportunities here and there to put him on the other side of the ball. So I think it's kind of already in that culture. So right now, if I was going to make a mock draft, I'm probably going Travis Hunter as a receiver to the New England Patriots. With the number one pick. Absolutely. I do. I, I think in a draft class that really does lack a true quarterback, not that New England would need one, and there yep. isn't a true number one real player in this draft yet. There's a couple edge guys that I think could kind of pop up there. There is – I love uh, McMillan, the wide receiver from Arizona, sure. who Travis Hunter just faced off against. That was, a, that was a really fun tape to watch. But, you know, Travis Hunter just offers so many things on both sides of the ball that that no one else can. And I truly do think this is one of the most unique and borderline best prospects I've ever seen. All right, what I want to do, and I'm going to start uh, with you, John. We're going to take a look. You can find this. This is uh, last year's draft guide. So you can find uh, right about here in the inside. Where is it? Let me get it. Uh, there you go. <laughs> It's on the inside cover here, uh, so it's uh, actually page two. Uh, and, uh, and, and what this is is we have a scouting one-on-one -on -one section, and for each position, it goes over, matter of fact, word for word, when scouting football players, there are specific things that scouts look for when grading players. So for each position, you talk about uh, those specific things. So I'm going to start with, uh, with you, uh, John, and, and I'm going to start – uh, again, since you're going to be taking over the cornerback spot in this discussion, let's start with some of those. I want you to grade, since you had an opportunity to look at them, I want you and grade them any way you want, any way you want. And I'm going to go over some of these. Uh, uh, I'm going to go over some of these specific things, and you tell me what you think about his grade right now. Let's start with instincts. Yeah, I mean he's an excellent zone corner. He's got a very good feel for pattern pressure, as we call it. Um, you know, as far as the, when he plays hard corner, for example, 
He's excellent at high-low routes. He can play underneath the, the deep out route, the corner route, and he can play up to the flat. He's got a very good knack of stressing throwing lanes and handling overlapping zones. He's very, very polished as a zone corner, extremely aware, of sees multiple threats and the quarterback, um, and he can play deep outside. He can play, and he can see that, you know, the, the crossing routes coming from the other side. He's got very, very good vision, very big eyes, as we call it. And by the way, as I go through this, uh, starting with corners and starting with you, John, Dave, if you have anything you want to uh, interject along the way, you, you and, and vice versa, please do. Um, now, you mentioned zone. So you have zone coverage and man-to-man -man coverage here. So whoever drafts him understands that he's playing zone, correct? No, he can play man, too. I mean, I, I just talking about – you talk about instincts. You know, he's a solid man. He's a very good press man corner. He's got a stiff – Offhand jam, he can ride and disrupt on the outside. He's physical. He can also play reactive press. He's very disciplined to keep his focus on the receiver, and that's half the battle, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, playing man coverage. You got to be disciplined. We, we like to – I coached corners for a number of years, and I used to tell those guys, if you're going to look at the quarterback when you're playing man cover, you're going to watch him complete a pass. So you're, you have to have your focus, uh, and he's very good at that. He can mirror – Route breaks, uh, he can stay in phase on vertical routes. He's got the speed, the cover deep, and, uh, you know, he's got good ball skills too. I mean, obviously, as a receiver, you figure you're going to have good ball skills. There are some corner coaches that the number one thing they look for is can you find the football when you're in phase or slightly even out of phase? You know, and uh, whereas uh, some coaches, their, their, their focus and man cover is totally going to be can you stick to your man and is your – can you have the eye discipline to do that? He can do both. That's what makes him unique as a corner is he can do both. He can mirror through the route tree and uh, not, not all corners can do that. All right. Talk about his tackling and run support, because if anybody wants to compare him to Deion Sanders, uh, that was of course a big weakness for Deion. Uh, Deion didn't want to get dirty on defense. We know that a lot of Olays. Uh, to be on <laughs> tackling uh, back in the day, but he was still a Hall of Fame player. So hey, every every guy's got a little bit of weakness. Everybody has the kryptonite. So talk about uh, Hunter's run support and tackling. Well, you know he's not the most physical tackler in the world. Uh, he's more of a catch tackler than he is a, a gather and drive tackler. That said, he's not bad. You know he's not a bad tackler. He's, he's uh, he doesn't uh, he doesn't miss tackles substantially. Uh, but he's more of a hang on tackler rather than gather and drive. And, uh, you know, he's not, not the most physical guy in the world, but that's okay. He gets the job done. You might give up some yards after contact, but uh, it's not going to be, we're not going to call that his number one strength as a defensive player. Let's put it that way. Uh, does he get a chance to blitz much? Not, I haven't observed it. You know, he's in the video that I've watched, you know, he's a, he's a, he's pretty much a cover corner. It's you a good a trait corner. here. There might be a corner blitz in there some somewhere, but I haven't I haven't observed it at this point. One number I like to look at, and it's not really a make or break. I don't think it affects ever affects a defensive back's grade, especially at corner, maybe more so at safety. But his missed tackle rate, it's a good metric that PFF can put out there for the public to see. And it's under eight percent. And that's a anytime you see a single digit next to a, a yeah. defender's name on a missed tackle rate, that is a good sign. So while he might not be you know, Sam Madison as a, as a tackling cornerback run supporter, he, do, like John says, he gets the job done. And for an elite cover corner like this, that's, that's the, all you really care about. No, it's important. In my opinion, anyway, it's important as a corner because you don't want guys catching short passes and breaking tackles and getting, yeah. getting, you know, he gives up yards after contact though. There's, there's another metric on that that is much more advanced than PFF, which I get access to every now and then in terms of missed tackles, in terms of yards after contact. There's also a separation grade that uh, is out there, and his separation grade is tremendous. He doesn't give up very much separation at all, and he has very good recovery ability as well. His separation grade is like something like one uh you know, yard of sep one and a half yards of separation and his recovery ability is also very good. So, you know, he's tremendous. They even have that for linebackers too. So it's, uh, you know, there's some unique stuff there that's out there that is not generally available, but I get a chance to look at it every now and then. 
and uh, and he grades out very high and, and things like that. All right. Well, on the other side, then, Dave, uh, speak of his separation as a wide receiver. Yeah, I mean, his movement quickness and top end speed are elite traits. Um, th- those as high as high as you can get them. Last year, out of 6,900 defensive backs in the country, Travis Hunter clocked in at the second fastest of all in the nation last year, according to GPS tracking data. That And the defensive backs, guys, those, those are the fastest players on the field, usually, right? And Hunter is faster than almost all of them. That translates. And one thing he has, it's called I call it competitive speed. And I don't know where he's going to clock Travis Hunter, to be honest with you. I don't know if he's a track speed guy, but – you could, you could, you're going to have a really hard time finding any tape on him where he's getting outrun. There are certain players in the NFL today where I don't really care about their 40 time. They are faster than the guy that they're playing against, whether in this case, Hunter's running away or running to someone. Uh, that, that game day speed, is it shows up all over the field. Um, I know we'll get into some of his ball skills, but when I watch him attack the football, I mean, it is such elite level speed and quickness. And I think go to kind of building off of John's point of how instinctual he is as a corner. This is where the fact that the dude plays over a hundred snaps every week split between two sides of the ball. He knows the game at a much deeper level than everyone oh, yeah. because he plays both sides. And I yeah. think he has the intelligence level to take that experience and apply it to his play on the field. This kid is a, is a 4 student. He's an academic all American. So we're talking, this is incredibly rare, an, 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 all Amer- an All-American on the field and in the classroom. I can't tell you how rare that is. It's unbelievable. And this, so he's just, uh, I mean, this is the kind of guy that you know is going to take all this knowledge that he takes from being an effective player on both sides of the ball, and he will apply that to whatever spot he's actually playing. By the way, the, this- the, thing, the thing about, too, is, you know, as far as he, his recovery ability is tremendous. There are some instances where he will – overextend and press and temporarily get separated. And that's why his separation grade isn't perfect, but he can recover. His ability to recover his quickness and uh, his ability to close, you know, if he is ever separated on a route break is, is elite. It's probably one, it's probably the best guy out there, you know, right now. And, and, and like you said, GPS tracking, he's one of the fastest players in football. All right. Uh, talk about what is the difference when they when when the average fan reads uh, release and separation. What is the specific differences between both? Talking about as a receiver. As a receiver. Yeah. Well, that's what, then. Go ahead, Dave. So, what was the question, Greg? You have two different terms here: release, separation. So the release is when, when he's up against press coverage, it's not just the ability, it's not just speedy quickness. There's technique and there's different releases and different footworks to avoid a long press corner, which is an issue for him. I mean, he's not a big guy. He's actually very undersized. He's 20 pounds less than the NFL, the average NFL wide receiver. So you know that in year one, especially, that's going to be a key thing that he's going to have to prove on tape against NFL corners is how yeah. well does he get a release off of press coverage. And then separation is once you get to that, you know, the, the break in your route, how quickly can you change direction? And do you need to slow down? Do you lose your leverage? Do you, do your, do your hips rise as you try to change direction? And that's one thing I love about Travis Hunter's game. He does not lose speed, whether he's tracking the ball or running route. So if he can, I do think he's going to have to prove that he can get off press coverage because very few corners are trying to do it at the college level. And it's a whole different game in the NFL. That's the one concern I would have with him, but his ability to separate is already elite. It's the question will be, can he get off that press coverage at the line? And there's a lot of different ways to go about it. You don't have to be big and strong, but there, there's a lot of technical components to it. I know when we just talked about his hands as a corner, yes, he's a receiver, so his hands should be above average for the position. But for a receiver, how how strong are his hands? Historic historic greg he's got one drop in 133 targets all right wow. nobody does that nobody think of every every best receiver in the nfl right now nobody did that in college not one of them he's caught 85 percent of his targets this year all right out of, out of the the 198 receivers with 26 plus catches in the it, this year in ncaa that's number one in the country his catch percentage 
Um, his hands are not good. They are elite and not, not just for a corner, not for a hybrid player. The guy has some of the best eye hand coordination I've ever seen. And this is what this is probably we'll get into his ball skills, which I want to reflect on in a little bit. But ball skills, a part of that great process is how strong are your hands. And you can't ask for stronger hands than what Travis Hunter has on, in the score box, but also on tape. Well, uh, talk about some of those, including, you know, his long ball, uh, his crowd reactions. Talk about his overall ball skills. I want anyone, if anyone has any access to tape, I'm sure you can even find the game on YouTube. Okay. Third quarter versus Baylor this year, 328 left. Colorado's down seven points. Okay. Anyone, if you're on YouTube, you can probably find that game. I'm sure you can watch the broadcast angle. I, think I know the play you're talking about. Yeah. Well, we got to have make sure, make sure Ruben goes Let's ahead go. and plays this. I should right go now. find it right now. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter runs a post route. Sanders launches it. Great throw, by the way. Hunter actually sees that Sanders throws the ball and he takes his eyes off the ball and puts his head down as if he's running the floor. He sees Sanders throw it. This is 30, 40 yards downfield. He puts his head down, gives a look to the safety to kind of see where he's at, looks at where the other safety is in addition to the trailing corner, looks back up without any loss of speed, balance, control, finds the ball for the second time and hauls it in for a 40-yard catch. You know, he has another 30-yard catch a couple plays later. Colorado scores a touchdown. They win the game. I I just texted someone right now before this because I was just kind of refreshing some of my eyes on, on tape, and I don't think I've ever seen that. You know, the, the guy literally on a, on a downfield pass took his eyes off the ball just to kind of see where everyone else was. It took 0.6 seconds. I measured it. He was off the for a half a second, essentially. Finds the ball again, brings it in. That's the kind of thing that just – you can't teach that. You don't practice that. No. You don't hope that someone gets that. That's an innate trait that makes him special. And that that in addition to the ability, he never slows down when he's attacking the football. They send him on these crossers often at Colorado. And Sanders has actually, it's one of Sanders' best throws. I've actually grown to appreciate Sanders' ball placement because of Travis Hunter film. And what I think he does at a really high level, which again. Uh, Very remember, accurate passer. Yeah. The, the NFL combine, you know, they do that line drill where they run down the line, they're going back and forth, left to right. And one of the things Daniel Jeremiah is always talking about every year, I feel bad for him, he's got to keep repeating this, that can these guys stay in the line? Can they maintain speed? Do they pop up when they have to catch it? Hunter stays on that line running a 4 2 5 40 and never drops the ball. And, and you know, th th these are traits that ball skills, I just have on my sheet right here, the most elite trait that Travis Hunter has as a receiver are the ball skills. Short, intermediate, long, traffic. The guy catches the ball in traffic um, of the 40 wide receivers that have seven plus contested throws to them this year. He ranks third in catch rate. Again, this is an undersized wide receiver that is dominant in contested situations. The touchdown catch that he had in North Dakota state that everybody in the world saw that first week where the, the cornerback is on top of him, getting pushed out of bounds. And he somehow gets both hands under the armpit of the corner as he's falling the other direction and uses every inch he has to surround that ball with his hands and brings in a touchdown. I mean, the level of concentration, coordination, and accuracy that this kid has with his hands, whether he's down the field, whether he's short, whether he's moving lateral, vertical, he, it just, the, you throw the ball and it's within reach. He's going to come down with it. Now I know. I'll give uh, you one thing. Uh, let me add one thing. To sure. What I've observed, you know, with Hunter in film, in fact, I've been watching film as we speak going back and looking at, you know, make it, made a little tape of Hunter. And, uh, but, but I watched that Baylor game and there was one of the things that I observed, it was he has the ability to find an open spot, a soft spot in zone coverage as well. He's very, very smart offensive player. Uh, and, you know, and, and in that particular game, there was one play where, you know, there was a little bit of a, a delay, some, some pressure on Sanders and he was able to find to sit in an open spot and just slide to an open area where there was no defenders and get open. And the ball was not a great throw, and he made a tremendous catch. Uh, his body control, along with his ability to just simply find open areas in zone coverage, is, is tremendous because there's going to be balls that are going to be thrown away from the defenders that are hard to get to, and he's got that ability to get to them. Tremendous Special. catch radius. Tremendous Special. catch radius. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know uh, they're in different draft classes and I know you can't give me an official number, 
But Marvin Harrison last year as the top receiver, and everybody talked about what a great player, and of course he is as, as, a, as a prospect. Marvin Harrison Jr. was a 978. If Marvin Harrison was in this year's draft class heading up, and you're saying Travis Hunter could be number one, is Travis Hunter still number one, Dave? As a wide receiver only, I'm going to say no. But yeah. you have I, to I'm, consider the fact that I'm he can agree with on that. If you told me, Greg, hey, the guy's not allowed to play two sides. They come up with a new rule, and he's only <laughs> going to be a wide receiver. I don't think I put him above Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison, maybe not even Roma Dunze as a wide receiver only. I do think he's right there. Just like last year, I said Brian Thomas is right there with those guys, but I can't put him above. Uh, he's a different kind of player. The one concern I have with him, it's a credible concern, is it's the size. He weighs about yep. 180 pounds. Yeah. Um, the top 10 wide receivers are the top 10 wide receivers in the NFL this year with receiving yards. They're all 195 plus pounds. Nine of them are 200 plus pounds. 20 pounds is a big deal. The closest body comp I have is actually the next receiver in, in, in the, in that top 10 group in terms of size is Garrett Wilson. They have very similar physical profiles coming out. And I know this is probably not the best week to praise Garrett Wilson after the drop that bounced off his chest Sunday night. I'm still a huge Garrett Wilson fan. I think he's a very good wide receiver, but there are issues that are popping up from Garrett's game over the past couple of years because of size and Travis yeah. Hunter. I don't know if he's going to be a guy that all of a sudden becomes 195. So that yeah. is the one concern that could keep him out of that elite trait. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I and that worries me too as a corner, which is why I'm a little bit, which is why you know the shoulder injury right now is. I'm not saying that's proof of that, but, uh, you know, he's going to be limited to a certain degree, you know, as far as a two-way player. If he's a little bigger, I, I wouldn't have any any qualms about playing him both ways more. But, um, you know, I look at Roy Green, and Roy Green wasn't that big either. But, um, and he's he's my comp. I know it's a long time ago. So yeah, probably different don't even know who Roy Green was, but <laughs> that's my best comp for, uh, for uh, a hunter, you know, at this point in time. But, uh, yeah, as far as Marvin Harrison Jr., he's, uh, he's really, really special. He's in a class by himself in some ways, you know, coming out last year. So, yeah, I, I yeah, agree with I, that. What I remember of Roy Green Jr. was with St. Louis playing in that crappy baseball stadium they used to play in. Oh, that was just terrible. Uh, Bush Stadium, the old Bush Stadium, yeah. Yeah, that, oh, that was awful. That was an awful franchise when I was growing up. Uh and they were playing in the NFC East too, which was kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, so Dave, though, I'm not going to let you off the hook here because you said uh, if he could only play one position. So that's not the case. Yep. So he can play both positions. So mm -hmm. where would you rank him? I mean, it, it, keeping that all those things considered, I do think Travis Hunter would probably be – in that same grade, if not a higher grade than Marvin Harrison. I actually think okay. I would put that out there because of the versatility that he could do. Um, risky because, again, the size does concern yeah. me. He was banged up last year. He's banged up this year. And, again, this is going to be the first thing we open the video up with is, are, is there cohesion and chemistry between the front office and the coaching staff? That's going to dictate a lot of Travis Hunter. So you can make the argument that because he is going to be reliant on that more than a Marvin Harrison, you can't put him in that tier. So, but if you're asking me, I'm starting a team tomorrow and I get to make the first pick of the draft and it's Marvin yeah. Harrison or Travis Hunter, I'm going with Travis Hunter. Well, you know, and, and the, the key point there is, you know, you have to decide, you know, are, how are you going to use him? Yeah. I mean, you've got value on both sides of the ball, obviously. And it may end up being that his value is only on one side of the ball because mm -hmm. of the fear of injury and, things of that nature. You know, you got a great receiver. Do you want to risk him playing defense or, you know, vice versa? Um, so that's where I think, you know, you wonder long-term, is he going to stick at both spots? Yeah. Or is he just simply going to be like Deion Sanders was? He's going to play one one spot. In Deion Sanders' case, it was defense, and he gave you some offense occasionally. Yeah. There have been guys that have done that over the years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure the value is that much greater. Uh, if, you know, if he could play full time at both sides and if there was a way we could do that, turn him into Superman and he can play starting corner and he can play, he can also play um, receiver all the time. 
then I think the value is definitely there. I'm really wondering how high he's going to go simply mm. because of that problem. Yeah. You know, it's how we're going to use him. If they don't see him as the, the elite receiver in the, in the Marvin Harrison Jr. category, is he going to really be the number one pick in the draft? I'm not mm. convinced he's going to be the number one pick in the draft. I may be, I'm, I don't know. Let's put it this way. I'm not making a prediction. I yeah. just don't know. And I think some of it is those situations. Hey, we got this great tool. Can we really use him? Can we really use him like we want? You know what I mean? Uh, so that's where, you know, you can get all excited about it when push yeah. comes to shove. How are you going to coordinate those activities between offense and defense? Yeah, not not everything is from college translates to the NFL. And you, there's a lot of examples of that. And the, the last thing I would close with here is even though I think – I would pick receiver. It does make sense to keep him on defense more and kind of put him into certain situations on offense. You just simply have more control yes. on that side of the ball. Like you can dictate, you know, on defense, it's a very unpredictable nature of football. You're reacting to what the offense is doing and you can't protect him. Right. But on offense, you can kind of pick and choose your spots. And yes, I do know these guys take hits after the catch. That's probably the pro predominant concern you have with him but there are it's easier to implement him into specific plays and packages and situational football on offense than it is defense so i can i can see both sides of this argument but i would just kind of follow my gut and say i think he could be a special receiver that could be a dime back as greg as john put it yeah and you know the thing about it is there, there aren't too many situations like that you know where i think we've seen a lot more of the other where guys play defense and supplement it on offense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's where, and, you know, but there's been cases where guys eventually became offensive players only. And, you know, they started out, you know, doing both. And then bingo, they ended up, hey, this guy's a great receiver, like Roy Green. But uh, but there's been other guys that have, you know, have, uh, you know, supplement. And the other, and you're, you're exactly right. I mean, and, to elaborate further on that, you know, is I'm an offensive guy and I'm running 11 personnel and I'm going to, or maybe I'm going to run 10 personnel and I can use this receiver for 10 snaps because he's going to be my, my W back. He's going to be my, my fourth wide out. We're going to use a lot of 10 personnel in this game. So maybe I got 15 snaps for this guy, but on defense, he's my starting corner. And even if he's a nickel back, or a dime back, let's say a team's playing 10 or playing 11 and they're playing, you know, an Isaiah likely type receiver all the time out there, you know, you're going to have to go that route. And so um, where he's going to be on the field a lot more than you anticipated because of the personnel groupings that you're seeing. So for sure, it's easier to do it on offense because of personnel. And I know we keep talking about, well, what the general manager is going to do, what's the situation with the relationship with the coaching staff. But the other thing we're leaving out is, is what about the man himself? What happens? I mean, I know it's early in the process, but are we at some point going to hear rumblings through his agent or through himself about Travis Hunter? Because we're, we're saying, well, what does Travis Hunter want? His agent is going to want to make a lot of money. He's going to be wide receiver. But, well, what if a team wants to draft him and play corner? Is Travis Hunter going to be okay with that? And does that become an issue? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't. Become, it, I'll tell you when it becomes an issue. It becomes an issue in the fifth year. If he's a first round pick, that's when it becomes <laughs> an issue. When that second contract, that's when it becomes an issue. It doesn't, it's not going to be an issue because he's going to get paid what he's going to get paid for if he's a first round pick. Yeah. True. But down the road, if he sees $20 million for a receiver and he sees $10 million for a corner, yeah. <laughs> he may say, guess what? I'm a corner. <laughs> or I'm a receiver. I'm, I'm a sorry. receiver. I'm a receiver. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, last one, and we've got a few minutes to go here, uh, Dave, and that is uh, we talked about uh, his run support, his physical uh, play on defense. But offensively, uh, as, as either a downfield or inline blocker, uh, overall, it's, it's, it's an important – uh, uh, trait to have, especially some teams. You could draft a receiver. They might, they're not going to draft a receiver unless he's capable of blocking and things and being physical. Where does he grade on that on, on that uh, trait? Effort, aggression, it's all there. Uh, capability and effectiveness. I would say it's average to below average. This is where the size does pop up. 
Uh, you'll have a lot of coaches say that blocking is is 80% mental, 20% physical. You can buy into that or not, but the truth is uh, he's not going to win anyone over because of his blocking. But I think one way to cancel yourself off the sheet would be that there's no effort there. And Travis Hunter does not have an issue there. Uh, he, he's downfield throwing blocks. Um, he'll make good initial contact. It's just the ability to sustain that he really struggles with. And I think that just stems from the, the size and, and lack of pure strength that he has. But it, it's not anything that's going to alter my grade. You know, if there was something egregious in, uh, that was negative on tape that kept on popping up, maybe it would. But I don't see that. But I'm also not going to raise him up any more than I have him because of his blocking. Because at the end of the day, it's not that effective. All right, we're going to close with this last question for each of you, and that is going to be, I'm the general, I'm the GM, you're the assistants. Uh, Dave, we're going to start with you. You're the offensive hey, assistant. Hey. You want him to be drafted as a wide receiver. So explain to me, g- give me your passion plea. I got my um, call coming in here, so uh, I hate to. Why don't you go first then, John? Yeah, you me... give us the passion play right. first of why he needs to be playing defense for our team. Okay, well, you know, if it was me, why he needs to play defense because he's the best. He's one of the top two or three corners in the draft, and we need a corner. And uh, so if I'm a defensive coach, you know, I'm going to be up on, or if I'm an offense, or if I know our defense is weak, we need a corner. And I see this kid as being really, really special compared to the other corners. And in all honesty, the way it's turning out, he just might be the top corner because I'm seeing some hiccups with some of these other guys as I study them. And, uh, we need the top corner in the draft and he is the top corner in the draft, then that's, that's the, the push I'm going to make for him. Let's draft this kid as a corner and we can use him situationally as a wide receiver. Uh, and against some offensive guys going to say the same thing possibly, but I think in some case, in some ways, he may be a better corner than he is a receiver, even though he's elite at both. Yep. Um, so that's what I would say. Okay. I'm not saying he is, I'm sure. saying he may be and some team may look at it that way. We see him as the best corner and the fifth best receiver. That's hypothetical. And so let's draft him as a corner and let's let's get an elite player with our third pick or second pick in the draft. Okay. And if you if that call comes through, uh we'll uh we'll, we'll say goodbye quickly. Okay. Uh, uh your turn, Dave. G- give me your plea. Why is why do we need to draft him as a wide receiver? I mean, if you're the GM, I'm going to tell you that this league is uh, this league is now built on offensive football. This league is built on speed. He is elite in both categories. Um, I see traits in him that cannot be taught. I see traits in him that I have not seen in a long time when it comes to the combination of ball skills, toughness, intelligent, and that enough it, that that alone is enough. I think there are special traits in him as a receiver, and I don't see special traits in him as a cornerback. And that enough, that's enough for me. Now, if you're the owner, Greg, if you're owner, Greg, instead of GM, Greg, I'm going to say, tell me the last time uh, you had thousands and thousands of fans show up to watch a cornerback. Now, these, this, this guy is going to fill the seats because of what he can do on the offensive side of the ball. You could still put him in on defense here at certain packages, but this game, whether we agree with it or not, personally, it's built on offense. It's built on speed. And because this guy is an elite in that category, you have to put him there. Well, you know, if the only thing I would say to that is, is, is a coach talking, you know, it might be just a coach, coach, coach looks at it maybe a little differently. We see him as a fifth best receiver. Like you even said, he might not be Roma Dunze or any of these other guys. So uh, anyway, bottom line, it depends on who, who's making the call. All right. I got to take the call. See Thanks ya. guys. Great Good job. job. Thank See you. Next time.